This video is brought to you by Hit Point Press and their Big Bad Booklet series. Hello and welcome back to The Gallant Goblin. Oh man, I live for this. This is the Lost Omens Ancestry Guide for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And Pathfinder Ancestries are big and chonky and meaningful mechanically. Oh. Hi, Tilly. <laughs> and more so, I think, than even D&D and Starfinder, in my opinion. To me, the most interesting thing about them is their feet options. And not like paws and claws kind of feet, but their abilities, their feats. You get the first one at first level, and then another at fifth, ninth, thirteenth, and seventeenth level. And this book introduces 14 new ancestries and versatile heritages, which I'll talk about in a sec, and expands upon 14 previously introduced ones with new heritages and feats. So if you're strictly a D&D player, I think you'll still find this video interesting to see a new take on many of the races that you may already be familiar with, and to see what other options Pathfinder gives you that D&D doesn't. But before we jump in, I just wanted to let you know that our Patreon has gone live. Ah, I'm aiming to post three behind-the-scenes videos there each week, plus we've been releasing some 5e supplements to flesh out our own in-world Gallant Goblin Tavern with new NPCs, and you get early access to our videos, among other things. I'm also running a Candlekeep Mysteries game for a few of our Patreon backers. At the time of this recording, we have two slots left if you want to jump into the campaign and sign up in the first month to receive our new Gallant Goblin logo mini, which is super cool. You can learn more and become a Patreon backer yourself today at patreon.com slash thegallantgoblin. Also, stay tuned at the end of this video for the winner of our Starfinder Planets Apparel Booster Box giveaway. Now, very quickly, just to make sure you're all caught up, your ancestry in Pathfinder 2nd Edition is your overall race, human, elf, orc, etc. Each ancestry also has a number of heritages, which you can think of as like sub-races, which sometimes is tied to the region of the world in which you were born or your general family background. And then you have your feats, which is more tied to your early experiences and those abilities that you pick up during the course of your life. And finally, you have versatile heritages. This is a heritage, like a subrace, that can apply to any ancestry. For example, this book introduces the beast kin versatile heritage. So think of lycanthropes and were creatures. So you can be human or dwarf or elf or orc or any other humanoid ancestry and apply the beast kin versatile heritage on top of that. So if you want to be a Tengu were shark, and who doesn't? then you can take the Tengu Ancestry from the Advanced Player's Guide and the Beastkin Versatile Heritage from the Ancestry Guide here. And then, when you're selecting your Ancestry feats, you can choose from those of the Tengu or the Beastkin. One excellent thing this book does is give you advice as a GM about allowing a Beastkin player character into your campaign, as that can be a little tricky to pull off while still being true to their nature. There are so many new options in this book that a full inventory of them would make this video extremely long. So let's just do a brief overview of each one like we do with the minis. We're going to start with our expanded options for existing ancestries and versatile heritages. Anything listed as a versatile heritage can be applied to most humanoid ancestries, sometimes with special rules or restrictions. All of these ancestries and heritages are considered uncommon in the world of Galarian, so you'll have to talk with your GM before you pursue one. Each of these entries has four full pages with expanded narrative lore, about 13 new feats spread out across the various levels, and sidebars with role-playing and character-building tips, and additional lore about history, current events, settlements, and other matters. For our ancestries, you get around two to five new heritages to go along with them. Now, a few of these ancestries you may be unfamiliar to you, or at least a bit different than what you may be used to if you're coming from D&D. Asimars in Pathfinder are a versatile heritage and represent any character with a celestial influence. They don't have to necessarily be descended directly from an angel. They could have also received a special blessing or have been born in a highly sacred place. The Ancestry Guide expands the options of where your celestial power may come from. Perhaps you're an emberkin descended from a fallen angel, an idolkin from Nirvana, or a plumekin from the mother of birds. The uh, as 
Azarkedi, it's hard for me to pronounce there, they're also known as Gilmen to me, that's what I call them, the Gilmen, or the Low Aslanti. And they're survivors of the cataclysm that befell the ancient human empire, but transformed into these kind of aquatic creatures with gills. This is actually a free ancestry you can pick up using the link in the doohickey down below. The ancestry guide expands upon their magical connection to water. For the cat folk, some of my favorites, you can get expanded options to explore their natural agility and luck. Changelings are the descendants of hags, and as you know, there are a lot of different kind of hags. So this book expands the options for your hag parentage, from moon hags to winter hags to blood hags and storm hags. Though interestingly, I don't think any of those hags have any stat blocks in second edition just yet, unless they're maybe tucked away in some adventure path that I haven't seen yet. Also, by the way, WizKids, if you're listening, we need new Pathfinder hag minis and Tingu wear sharks. Thank you. Damphirs are basically half vampires. And similarly, the book gives you options for different types of vampire parents. You have psychic vampires known as Veta Lornaras, Lornaras, Pronouncing, pronouncing some of these is tough. Veda Laranas. Yeah. And ancient vampires called Strigoi, which you may be familiar with. And the so-called hopping vampires from Tianjia, the Jiangxi. Pardon my pronunciation of those, too. Next, we have the Duskwalkers, who are folks who have been reincarnated. And here you get more options for how your previous life may have ended, which impacts your abilities in your new life here. For example, dying due to an unfortunate bit of luck gives you the chance to re-roll a saving throw or a recovery check. The Hobgoblin chapter really dives into their history and the various settlements they have across the inner sea region. And the new feats just generally expand on their capabilities in a number of different ways. And next is our kobolds. This chapter is formatted pretty much like the Hobgoblin one, going over the various kobold tribes in the inner sea region. The feats expand on your weapons and trap making options and allow you to grow wings across the course of your adventure, which is really cool. Starting at level five, you can sprout little winglets that let you kind of hop a little further and higher. But by level 17, you'll be flying around like a dragon wormling. The plant folk Leshy get a lot of well-deserved love here with five new heritages, letting you be a cactus, a fruit, a lotus, root, or seaweed Leshy, though they have only eight new feats to kind of balance things out there. The lizard folks, or Eruxi, get two new heritages and 14 new feats, which focus on their mystical connection to the stars and to the bones of their ancestors. You also get the ability to dangle by your tail and permanently transform into a large-sized lizard folk, which is awesome. The orcs get three new heritages and nine new feats, which really focus on the magical war paint that they apply to their faces. You can choose the magical tradition of your mask, arcane, primal, divine, or occult, which will affect its abilities, and you can expand its power as you level up. The Rat Folk or Yasoki chapter expands on the various clans around the world and gives you two new heritages, Snow Rats and Tunnel Rats, plus 10 new feats that do things like expand your options with your cheek pouches or let you cast Enlarge once per day on yourself and any Rat Folk Yasoki allies nearby. The Tengu also get two new heritages and a whopping 15 new feats. One Feet Tree focuses on your Feather Fan, which stores spells that you can use later during the day. You also get expanded flight options and the ability to eat fortune every hour instead of every day, making you extra popular in the shackles. Finally, the Tiefling heritage means that you have some fiendish blood in your veins. Like the Asimar and the Damphirs and the Changelings, the options here expand on the source of your fiendish blood. Here's one of my favorites in the whole book. Maybe you're descended from a Rakshasa, gaining echoes of their courtly graces and illusory magic. And those are our expanded options. I don't know how you can read through this book and not immediately want to get involved in half a dozen Pathfinder games to explore all these options, but that's just half the book. Let's dive into our entirely new options. Now, all of these are uncommon or rare as well, meaning you'll have to consult with your GM about developing a character or, you know, for that ancestry for your game, and it's going to vary from campaign to campaign what's available for you. So each new ancestry gets six pages of new lore, heritages, and feats, and each new versatile heritage gets four pages of lore and feats. So let's start with one of the core races from Starfinder, 
the Android. Now, I could take a whole video here to talk about the lore behind the androids, or really any of these ancestries, but the origins can be traced to a crashed starship in Numeria. They are crafted biomechanical beings with souls, and five included heritage here reflect the purpose for which they were constructed, maybe as artisans, or as impersonators, or laborers, or C-3PO type polygots, or warriors. Some of the feats allow you to use nanites to do things like repair yourself, increase your abilities, fight diseases, and conceal you from danger. A very cool ancestry that would be great for a campaign set in Numeria. Next are the Aphorites. You are connected to the plane of Axis, which is the lawful plane of order and logic. Aphorites were made to be emissaries to the other planes with an intrinsic desire for order and understanding, but also with free will. They generally have a metallic, crystalline sheen to their skin, and their traits revolve around sensing and understanding the world around them and imposing order upon it. Our next heritage is the Beastkin, mostly lycanthrope, but it covers any person who has the ability to partially or fully transform into an animal. The book recommends bats and eagles and sharks and spiders, wasps, wolves, or, wait for it, T-Rexes. But it doesn't place any limit on your animal choice. You gain the chain shape ability to switch between whatever ancestry you have and a hybrid of your ancestry and beast forms. Feats let you really explore your transformation options, including gaining additional senses, transforming fully into your animal form, quickly changing shape for combat, gaining certain primal spells, and even enlarging your hybrid form. Oh, it's really fun stuff. Next, we have the Kyall, often referred to, and not affectionately, as Fetchlings. Like the Gilman, they can trace their ancestry to ancient Aslant, though instead of surviving by going under the waves, their ancestors escaped into the Shadow Plane and were warped by the shadows as the generations passed by. Their five heritages reflect the different ways the Shadow Plane warped their physical forms, and their feats play with the idea of shadows, using them not only to shroud, but to manipulate and hold objects, to facilitate sight, and to assault their foes. If you saw my review of the recent Pathfinder Battles mini collection, Darklands Rising, you'll probably remember the flesh warps. This is what happens when people are permanently altered by magic, and the heritage explains the source of that warping. Maybe you were grown in a vat, mutated by exposure to magic, or maybe you were just warped by technology. As you can imagine, the feats for flesh warps are pretty fun. You might be coated in acid, or able to contort and shrink your body, or have extra eyes, or maybe you just have an enormous set of tentacles that spew out of your mouth, as one does. Here we have the Gonzi, in many ways the opposite of the Aphorites. The Gonzi are agents of chaos who can trace themselves back to the plane of Maelstrom. Like the Aphorites, Gonzi is a heritage. Their appearance varies widely as befit their chaotic natures, but many have tails that tend to have a mind of their own. And in fact, the feats have a line where you can develop your tail to smash things, manipulate things, steal things, and even disarm and trip your foes. The tail kind of becomes an extra member of the party. Here's another fun one, the genie kin heritage. Genie kin, as you might imagine, are generally planar scions who can trace their ancestry to some sort of elemental being, usually a genie. But sometimes people who were exposed to extreme elemental forces may also give birth to a genie kin as well. Now this one is unique in that you can choose from six general genie kin feats, no matter which type of elemental you came from, but there are also specific feats tied to each type of elemental. Let's start with fire the Ifrit. Uh, they are descended from the Ifrit, Salamanders, and Magma Dragons, the Scorpios of Galarian, essentially. They have fire resistance, and their feet lines focus on fire abilities, as you could probably guess. You could heat metal, summon fire elementals, produce flames, or just explode in flame, not hurting yourself, but definitely charring anyone nearby. Next are the Oreads from the Plane of Earth. They're generally stoic and steadfast and dependable. They may look metallic or have gems growing out of them. With feats, they can burrow under the earth or summon earth elementals or become an earth elemental themselves, among other things. The Suli embody a mix of elements and are often descended from Jan, who are genies of all four elemental types. They often have varying personality traits, one for each element they possess, and that may mean they can cycle through them on a regular basis, and their feats are quite versatile and focus on the Johnny magic and elemental defenses and offenses. 
The sylphs are descended from air elemental creatures like the djinn, invisible stalkers, and cloud dragons. The book describes them as perhaps flighty and airheaded, which is kind of on the nose, along with regular air elemental feats. You can also, you know, that you probably can imagine. They also have the ability to fly and hold their breath for a very long time. And finally, the Undine, Undine, I think that's how you pronounce it, are descended from the plane of water, perhaps with an ancestry that traces back to Merids or water methods or even brine dragons. They're generally flexible and moldable, making them perhaps the most varied of the Genikin heritages. They have a swim speed of 10 feet and can breathe underwater. Their feet revolve around shaping water and ice and mist to their needs. And one of their cooler abilities is that they can transform their fire spells to scalding steam so they're usable underwater, which is kind of neat. And one thing about these minis, if you're thinking about playing a Genikin Heritage, you may want to check out the Kickstarter for one of our sponsors, Kraken Ships, which has perfect elemental minis for your Genikin characters. Anyway, next is a fan favorite, or at least this fan's favorite, the Kitsune. They're a playful, magical, shape-shifting fox folk. They can shape-shift from their fox-headed humanoid form into a different animal or humanoid, depending on their heritage, of which they provide five. If you're wanting to play a trickster with a knowing glint in your eye and a sly smile, the Kitsune may fit the bill. Feats let you electrify your tail, uh, pick up some magical tricks, gain a star orb familiar, and gain new shape-changing forms, among other things. Now, this one is probably the most interesting addition in my book. The rare sprite ancestry from the Fey realm known as the First World. Okay, there's so much to discuss here. First, your size is tiny, not small, tiny. You can enter the space of another creature, which is important because your reach is zero. Their heritages all look extremely different. Their appearance does. From your typical fairies of lore to creatures that look like Jiminy Cricket, like this here on the cover here, to creatures that look like bats and all sorts of other things. Their feats are also really great with fey abilities like communicating with animals, gaining some spells, learning to fly, and becoming invisible. But the most important thing, the most important feat is one that you can and must take at first level. It's called Corgi Mount, and it allows you to start the game with a Corgi Mount. With kids, we also need that many. Let's wrap things up with the bird folk known as the Strix, who are enigmatic, loyal, and distrustful of outsiders due to their long oppression by the nation of Cheliax. They do not start off with the ability to fly, but they can learn through their feet trees. They're also able to create wind with their wings, throw their voice, and eventually assume the form of an ancient, enormal, enormous primeval Strix. And their heritage come, heritages come from the various roles that they take in their communal groups, from predators to scavengers to storytellers and more. And the last few pages of the book gives you some new ancestral gear, like the cat folk whip claw. That's hard to say. Cat folk whip claw, the genie can wish knife, and the tingu thunder sling. Plus a multi-page glossary and index, as Pathfinder has a lot of terms with proper nouns, and it can take a while to wrap your head around them. So if you're looking to create some new fun characters or provide new options for some of your existing characters, this is your place to go. And the next Pathfinder adventure path, Fist of the Ruby Phoenix, brings together adventurers from around the world, so that seems like a perfect place to introduce your exotic characters like that Tingu Wereshark. This 143-page Pathfinder Lost Omens Ancestry Guide is available now in hardback for an MSRP of $34.99 as a PDF for $24.49 on paizo.com and for $12.99 on Hero Lab Online. And now, for the winner of our giveaway for the Starfinder Battles Planets of Peril, the new set of pre-painted Starfinder minis from Whiskers that we reviewed a couple of weeks ago. You can see that review in the eye of the corner of your screen right now. The winner of the free booster box is... Aaron Luck. That's a name I've seen around our comment section for a long time. Congratulations! Drop us a line at thegallantgoblin at gmail.com to claim your prize. And many thanks to Hitpoint Press for their continued support. The Big Bad Booklet series is like signing up for the Adventure of the Month Club. You get these awesome comic book-sized adventures based around a new Big Bad each month. Each one has all the story and mechanics you need to run a side quest with your existing crew, or just a one-shot with whoever you have nearby at the time. You also get little packs of reference cards 
just to make your games even more efficient and fun. This month, come meet Shen, a devious and playful underwater clam monster who can evolve into more fearsome and powerful forms. Will you celebrate victory or clam up when you're in too deep? Subscribe today at BigBads.com. And thank you for watching today. This is the part of the video where I put you to work. Don't forget to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash thegallantgoblin. Come check out our socials at these links right here. Come chat with us on Discord using the link in the doohickey below. And if you enjoyed the video, leaving us a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking that little bell down there to activate notifications for our videos all helps us out a lot. But most importantly, stay safe, have fun, love each other, and I'll see you next time at the Gallant Goblin. <laughs>